Greetings and welcome. We are in Senior English B, and our objective now for the hour is an introduction to the second of the second generation romantic poets that we will be looking at, namely Shelley. Now, there's a couple of things that we want to say right away about this cat. And uh, you're working with me on 866, 867. We are moving in Generation 2 Poets from one radical poet in Byron to a second radical poet in Shelley. In what ways radical? Two ways. One, Shelley is going to be radical in his attempts to play games with form. Two, Shelley is going to be radical in his subject matter. Okay? He is a proclaimed atheist in his lifetime. And in fact, will write one of the key first arguments for atheism in Europe. That is radical for its day. Of course, we've already talked about the somewhat atheistic nature of Percy Shelley's lover backslash wife's novel, Frankenstein, as being controversial, theologically speaking. And now all of a sudden, here we are with the, she the great poet himself, Shelley. Byron and Shelley are pals. That's significant. Byron and Shelley are pals. Shelley, like Byron, lives a very experimental life, a very radical life. And, like Byron, Shelley also dies young. We will see this of all three both she uh, Byron, Shelley, and Keats, we will see this of all three of our Generation two Romantic poets. They do not live into old age. They die young. Um, interestingly, Shelley dies while on a boat on a lake where a storm comes in and he drowns. When his body is washed up onto the shore, in the pocket of his coat is found the collected works of Keats, some poetry of Keats. So we're going to talk about Keats later, but we should just point out something now for your notes about these Generation two poets. They have remarkable mutual admiration for each other. They are somehow, it seems, aware that they are doing things in poetry that nobody else has really yet done. And to that degree, they're kind of like a fraternity of sorts. All three of these poets recognizing in each other some importance. We often will begin with Shelley's Ozymandias, and that's where we'll begin on 866, 868, 869. And that's where we want to turn now, to Ozymandias. Okay? Now, as we look at this poem, right away, we're going to make some 2B observations. Namely, of course, we're working with sonnet form. And we're definitely working with a poem that's a sonnet, but not about love. So right away, let's point this out. If Shakespeare is the great sonneteer of love some 200 years prior, now Shelley's going to play the same game of the sonnet, but he will not be messing around with topics like love in this poem, but rather something else. We should point out how at 3A, this is not unlike another poet that we just recently studied who wrote a poem. You will maybe recall. Do you remember? Who wrote a poem that was a sonnet, but not a sonnet about love? Do you remember? The world is too much with us late and soon. Getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. This is Wordsworth, right? And of course, Shelley is going to play a similar kind of game. Now, this is a pretty complex poem, actually, in terms of structure. So we're going to look at it at to be, as well as, of course, in terms of just what is the poem all about? Let's read together, shall we? Yes. By the way, background information, top of 869, the Ozymandias of Shelley's poem is based, of course, on the actual Egyptian pharaoh, Ramses II. Ozymandias was his name in Greek. You might write that down, okay? Ramses II ruled during the 13th century BC he, and uh, figures in the biblical story of Moses. So for those of you who know the story of the Exodus, you may be familiar with this, with this Egyptian pharaoh, uh, who is, of course, well-known. He sponsored ambitious building projects. You want to write that down. And called for huge statues of himself to be built. According to an ancient story, one of these colossal statues was inscribed with this boast about his bold deed. I am Ozymandias, king of kings. If anyone wishes to know what I am and where I lie, let him surpass me in some of my exploits. And quote, in other words... 
on number one. You ever see these guys on the ball games with the styrofoam finger? I'm number one. I'm we're number one, right? Okay. Ozzy Mandias in his own lifetime was doing this kind of thing. Only the way he did it was not with styrofoam fingers, but with what? He did. He built huge statues to himself. It would be kind of like maybe one of the students in our school deciding, I am such a great student that I'm going to build a huge statue of myself and I'm going to put it right outside the front of the high school. And at the bottom it's going to say, I am the greatest student that Worland High School ever had or ever will have. Go ahead and jot down in your notes, Rokali. What would you say about a student who did that? It's interesting. The response is, Branson, what would you say about a student that did that? Right away, what would you say about that student? Clearly, that student does not lack for what? What would you say? Confidence, confidence we might say. Right? Clearly, a student doesn't lack for confidence. Arrogance. Arrogance, we might say. The P word here is? Pride. Right, right. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll maybe see some of that. Uh, Mr. Winder, you had a question. Though. Uh, why do you think they would refer to his Greek name? Why do you think? Right. This is a good question. This is a good question. So Shelley is, is academically trained in, in traditional ways in England, so he will learn Greek. It will be part of his education. So Ozymandias will be for him the Greek term. Uh, and, and to some degree, maybe you could argue, too, it has a nice ring to it in regards to his poetic line, Ozymandias, right? So maybe he likes it that way as well. Take a look at the poem we'll read, we'll exegete. So some, of, some of my students say, you know, this is one of the more intriguing poems we've studied in a while. Let's take a look at it. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies whose frowned and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal, these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sand stretch far away. Now I'll point out for your notes right away at 2A. This is a poem where Shelley gets to say something uh, and he doesn't have to say it. I'll say it again. Shelley says something in this poem that he does not have to come right out and say. Now I believe your textbook will refer to this as the romantic philosophy. Romantic philosophy. And we'll, and we'll be referring to this concept but before we get there, let's just work level one. Let's point out that this is a framing poem. Okay, for your notes, this is a framing poem. In other words, Shelley is the writer telling about a visitor, a pal of his, who is telling a story. So in some ways, Shelley is nothing more than like a journalist, think Chaucer here, right, who's just kind of writing some information down. Notice the opening line. I met a traveler from an antique land. Uh-oh, what's an antique land? What does the word antique mean? Old. Really old. And in Shelley's day, England is not old. What is old? Egypt is old. Right, Egypt is old. So he says, I met this guy that came back from a journey to Egypt. And he said something to me. Notice the colon. Now from this point on in the sonnet, it isn't Shelley who is telling the story. It's the antique traveler, or the, tra the traveler to the antique land, right? So in other words, this traveler says, Dude, I was down in Egypt, and I saw the most remarkable thing. And all Shelley does then, for the rest of the poem, is just to relate that information. Got me? Now, what is it that he tells us? Let's work at level one. First of all, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. So let's just jot down what that means. We're just putting it in our own words. What does that mean? Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert means what? Somewhere down in Egypt, in the middle of the desert, there is this two legs just sticking out the ground. Large, huge legs. A stone sticking out the ground. Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies. And of course your picture on... 868 now starts to make some sense. If I go in my truck and the sun is in my face, I will drop down my visor. What does the word visor mean? 
Its etymology actually means face. We use the visor to protect the face from the sun. A visage, you can see the etymological root here between visor and visage. A visage is a face. We're told, dude, down in the desert in Egypt, really strange. There are these two legs of stone sticking out the desert. And then next to it, on the ground, notice we're told here, pay attention to some of the adjectives, half sunk, a shattered visage. What does shattered mean? It's broken up. Yeah, it's broken up. In other words, the face of the statue is already starting to look somewhat destroyed. Whose frown, uh-oh, so we're, this is not a smiley face, right? This is a frowning face. Whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read which yet survive. What does that mean, cold command and sneer? What is a sneer? See, this is an interesting question. Back to my word game of putting a statue up a student putting a statue up of himself or herself. The obvious question is, what would the face look like? Would you try and have a face that was smiling? Would you try and have a face that was, what is a sneer? Do you even know what that word means? A smirk. What does smirk mean? A sneer or a smirk means what? Yeah, it's going, to deter, it's going to assume some notion of haughtiness, arrogance, right? In other words, some sense of superiority, we might say, right? Play this game real fast with the person sitting at your table and try and give them a look that is a sneer. See if you can even do it. Are you capable of a sneer real quickly? Some of you will say, I don't even know if I can do this on command. A sneer. Well, go ahead, give it a try. Some of you will say, this is a stupid exercise until I actually try it. And then something interesting is going to come to mind about a sneer. Do I have any good sneers in the room? Caballero, can give a good sneer? She says, no, leave me alone. Does anyone have a good sneer? Ozzy has a good sneer. Well, that would make sense, given the title of our poem. Uh, a sneer. Uh, jot down in your notes at 3B, then. How come is it hard to give a sneer? It's, it's hard to invent this, even. It's hard to do it, for those of you that just tried it. and It's like, it's not so natural to do this. Why come? Why is it so difficult to do this kind of sneering thing? To do it well... You have to believe certain things. What do you have to believe? Yes, that's the key. To do it well, you literally have to think of yourself as literally better than the person you're giving the look to. If not, immediately the sneer falls into a certain kind of smile. Just kidding, just kidding. That kind of thing. But if you genuinely think of yourself as superior to everybody else at your table, then you can give them this certain kind of sneer. We're told the sculptor is the one who made this. And he knew well, or he understood well, go back and read it. He knew well, or he understood well, right? The sculpture understood well those passions read, which yet survived stamped on these lifeless things. The hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. In other words, we're told something about this character from his picture from the stone. Write down, what do you kind of gather about Ozymandias? Is he the kind of guy you'd want to have over for a sleepover that night? No, probably not. This is not the guy you'd want for your best pal. Why come? Why not? What does he seem to possess in his very face? Which now begs a really intriguing question. A number of you as seniors, in your senior year, had to go through the process, two parts, of one, taking photographs of yourself, two, notice I said plural, you had to choose the image that would remain in some kind of an annual or a yearbook that would then capture who you were for the rest of your life and beyond. Now, some seniors, this is no big deal. They take a single photograph, they throw it across the desk to the yearbook advisor and say, deal with it, this is mine. This is me, go. Put it in there, I really don't care. Other students... This is fascinating. I've had seniors that say, you know, I never really thought about this. But I have students 
that spend large amounts of money, A, to take the photographs, and then B, spend a lot of time going over those photographs, determining which one will be the chosen one. Now I'm asking a 3B question. Why would you care at all? Which photograph? Dude, they're all you. No, 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 you don't understand. They're all me, but there are some that are better than others. Define better. Are you saying better in terms of your representation? No, because they're all you. What do you mean by better? See, and I have seniors that say, well, it's fascinating. I've never really been pushed to answer a question like this. This is one of those things we just kind of do and then kind of get to decide what it means. For example, do you choose a photograph that shows you smiling? Or do you choose a photograph that shows you not smiling? Do you choose a photograph that shows you serious versus maybe comic? In other words, representative of who or what you are. Our poet tells us that down in the sands of Egypt, there is this shattered visage face of a cat who definitely wanted a certain effect. Write it down real quickly. Now we're back to 2A or level 1. What is the effect that Ozymandias hoped to achieve when people looked at his sculpture? What did he want them to look at and to know about him? See, this is fascinating. Some of you will say, I've never really thought about the game that gets played with senior photographs. But in some ways, it is a self-portrait. It is you, but you have multiple options of you, and you choose the one that best represents what about you. Now, in some annual years, we even put quotes under these to somehow represent the student as well. But other years, no quotes attend the image. The image speaks for itself, or it doesn't. How many times have you looked at a photograph of a person in a yearbook and said, that doesn't look anything like him. That doesn't look anything like her. Which begs a really intriguing question. Why then was the photograph selected? In other words, maybe sometimes we put an image of ourselves out there, whether it be in a yearbook or on face filth or whatever, to try to represent not so much who we are, but who we would like to be. Maybe we would like people to think of us in a certain way, so we advance a certain photograph. Ozymandias wanted his people to have a certain view of him. What was that view? It, fear, in a word, yeah. Fear, keep going. They want to be, he wants them to be afraid of him. He is superior to everybody else. And of course, we know that Ozymandias, uh, Ramses II, built large amounts of structures, in fact, whole cities just for his name's sake, to be remembered. And, of course, one of these statues is a classic example. Why do you put a monument to yourself? I once had a senior that said, in my annual, where it says my name, I want a blank space. I don't want an image there. I want a blank space. I had another student that said, I want to draw something there. I don't want a photograph of me. I want to draw something there. I want to doodle a picture in my space. It's my space. I should be able to do with it as I wish. You see, this has been the subject of some debate over the years. No, we need a real picture of you. That is to say, a representation of you. But why? What's the point of this? Well, for Ozymandias, it was pretty simple. Or was it? Why did he build a statue for himself? in the first place. Narcissistic. Good, we can write that word down. That's a good word for us. What is Narcissus from the ancient Greek story? Narcissus, of course, the individual who looks into the lake, sees a reflection of himself and is so enamored of it, right? Has to keep staring over and over and over again. It's uh, like my uh, students and seniors once played the game of sitting outside on the little bench there. And right outside of the, uh, the shop store here, the glass, when it's nicely shined, it shows a reflection, just like the trophy cases or whatever. And observe all the students who walk by, and their first glance is into that, and they look at themselves. We have a tendency sometimes to want to see ourselves. Ozymandias was very interested in people seeing him. Now we'll continue. We're not done. On the pedestal down below, where the legs are, there are some words that he had inscribed on the pedestal. 
Look what his words are. And this is always fascinating when you have to choose a quote to reference you. It's funny to me to have these conversations with seniors. I will even have seniors that will come to me at the end of a school year and say, Mr. McGee, I need your help. The yearbook is asking of me that I provide a quote. What quote should I give them? Which I find somewhat ironic. Let me get this straight. You've been in school for 12 years, and you are asking me to somehow help you find a single line that will capture who you are. Where have you been for 12 years if you can't come up with one quote? And all of a sudden, it will often hit us as seniors. We've been going through school, but not, maybe not paying so close attention to the words we were reading. And so we really don't have necessarily a quote that references us. It says something interesting about who you are, the quote you choose. Look at what Ozymandias decides to put on his pedestal. He says, my name is Ozymandias. Oh, that's good. That tells us who he is, right? Because it is true. It is a big rock stone, right? So, I mean, it's, you know, rock uh, quarried uh, uh, face. So, it might be, you know, who is that guy? That kind of thing. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Well, now, wait a minute. At level one, we want to put in our own words a couple of interesting things. What is it that he says? First of all, he identifies who he is. I've had lots and lots of students who have said, if we're going to take a photograph of an athlete and put him inside of a trophy case, doesn't it make sense to you that at the bottom of that we would put their name and the year in which they participated? <laughs> Think about how unbelievably short-sighted our trophy case is. Of course everybody knows who that person is in the three or four years that the individual is either in school or immediately graduated. But come back in ten years. Well, you know this is true. You can look in the trophy case yourself. And you can look at pictures of people and go, who are those people? And I wonder how long ago that was that they wore their hair like that. What was that all about? You say, right? And notice, hello, speaking of those photographs, it would be interesting to take a field trip and go and take a look at some of those. Some of those athletes just standing. Others of those athletes engaged in the actual activity for which they received the award. Others of those athletes are playing some kind of comic game. Have you sensed this? They're dressed up in some strange outfit, or they have some kind of strange thing that they're doing, which says something about not so much their athletic ability as their personality or character. And it obviously begs the question, why would they do that? Why, why make a game out of it? Are they making a statement about the whole thing of being named in all state? Are they kind of wanting to be remembered as something other than an athlete? Obvious interesting questions here as to how it's done. Look at how Ozymandias wants to be remembered. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Well, what does that mean? What's he saying when he says king of kings? I am the greatest of all time. That would be like putting a statue in the front of the high school and you standing there, sitting there, however you wish to be. And at the bottom it would say, I am in your name. And then the next thing that's said is, I am the greatest student of all time. By the way, do you think there is such a thing as ever saying the greatest of all time? If you at all follow athletics, you know that lists that are produced by Sports Illustrated and elsewhere are constantly wanting to make the argument the greatest of all time. Would you agree? In almost every sport, we are of course now in the, engaged in a Winter Olympics in fact, right? This is always the case. Who is the greatest of all time? Obviously the debate is always about how you're going to measure it. And then there's always those fun debates about competing with an earlier generation athlete. Right? So, for example, I know these wrestlers are always doing this. Well, who's the greatest wrestler at Worland High School of all time? But it's not always an easy question because those early wrestlers wrestled in a different time. Or who is the greatest football player of all time? But wait a minute, those earlier football players maybe played at a different time. Where? Maybe they, for example, didn't have some of the challenges that athletes today have. Or is it the other way around? 
Maybe, for example, those early athletes didn't get to play with the level of equipment, for example. So is it, is it at all fair to say when you're playing with a helmet that has very little padding in it and you constantly are butting your head up against other people, that might argue they are stronger and therefore greater. You see what I'm saying? Notice here, he doesn't, he doesn't even quibble. I'm the greatest king of all the kings. And then he says something interesting. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Now, sometimes students are lost by this. Why did he build this statue? Who is he trying to impress? Go ahead, read the quote again. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Who's he talking to? Other. He's talking to other kings. Wait a minute. He's the Pharaoh of Egypt. Who is he really leaving this message for? The Pharaohs to come. Namely, what? What's he saying to all the Pharaohs to come? You will never measure up to me. No matter what you do, you will never measure up to me. Right? Compton's, I'm gooder than you. You see that's how that works, right? You will never, you will never be better than me. Wait a minute, we missed it. Look on my what? Now this is fascinating. Not look on my statue. That's not what he's saying. He doesn't reference the very statue. That the words are at the bottom. He says, look on my works. If you were a student and you put a statue in front of the high school and it said, my name is, in your name, I am the greatest student of all time, what would you say underneath that would be the equivalent of look on my works? Yeah, but lots of students went through high school. We, we call them valedictorians, straight-A students. How could you make the argument, you're the greatest student of all time, beyond great? I mean, it would go without saying that probably a person who claimed greatest student of all time status got all A's. Although one or two of us might argue that would be the worst rubric to, to argue the greatest student. You'd have to look at a lot of other stuff. Involvement, for example, in lots of other things. Uh, performances in those other areas, right? Right? So, for example, how, what does it mean works here? Works, like works in what way works? What do you imagine? Jot down in your notes what he's referencing. Look on my works, ye mighty, in despair. He's clearly not talking about the statue. First of all, the statue is just one work. That's a picture of him, a statue of him. What works is he referencing, do you imagine? Yeah, he builds whole cities. He has all these monuments that are constructed in his name and only for him. Notice the last part. Look on my works, ye mighty end. Despair. What does that word mean? Fear. Some students will say fear. And that's a, I mean, that's a fair one. We can jot down despair can have the meaning of fear. But it seems to have a lot more than just be scared. Don't even realize yes. In other words, I'm going to crush your little frail egos, all Pharaohs to come, now. I'm going to say to all leaders of the world who will ever live after me, you will never accomplish what I've accomplished. Despair means give up. That's what the word means. Give up. Don't even think that you can come close because you can't come close. Now, this begs a really intriguing question before we get to the rest of the ironic end of this poem. Now, I have athletes who, who struggle with this one. Think about this for a second. Some of you, of course, coming to the very end of your seasons, and it does beg a really intriguing question. For those of you who are athletes, you'll take this question one way. For those of you who have known athletes, you'll think of it in another way. Question. To be a really fine athlete, do you have to, on some level, be cocky? To be a successful athlete, do you have to, on some level, have a certain kind of arrogance about you? A certain kind of attitude that says, I'm the best. To be the best musician, do you have to have a sense that you're better than other people as you head into the competition for all Northwest or whatever it is? To be a top artist as you get ready to go to the art symposium. Do you have to have some sense? You can do it just a little bit better than everybody else. And if you're not voted the top, you're going to be kind of offended by that and shocked. 
Do you have to have that attitude, whether it's true or not? Is that a requirement to be a top athlete, a top artist, a top musician? Think of, in your own interest hobby field, who is, in fact, probably for you, number one. And then ask this question. Does that individual seem to exude a certain kind of cockiness? Do you think that individual knows that he or she is the best? And see how this game can go. I mean, think about, for example, models who get paid millions and millions of dollars for the work that they do. How about it? A Sports Illustrated swimsuit cover swimsuit model. That is to say, for that year, she will be labeled the most beautiful. Obviously, one way to think about this is in its sexual rendering, but I'm going to step from that now to another question. Do you think it's altogether possible that she looks at that picture that now is posted all over the world, both online and in hard copy, and says, I'm the most beautiful woman alive? Do you think she thinks that way? Do you think she needs to think that way? Or she'd never let her picture get put on the cover of a magazine of that mass distribution. She has to on some level, or does she? Is arrogance and confidence the same thing? So, for example, the athlete is asked, going into the final rounds of the state wrestling tournament, or the final game of a basketball championship, or a volleyball championship, and the athlete is asked in an interview, how are you going to do? And the athlete says, I'm going to win. What are you talking about? How am I going to do? What do you think I did all this work for? I'm going out to win. Is that perceived as confidence or as cockiness? The athlete just asks, how are you going to do it? I'm going to win. Not, I hope to win. Not, I pray that I'm blessed to win. I will win. Do you need, do you need to have that level of confidence to be a superior ball player, superior artist? See, it's an interesting question. Watch this one. Here in a few days, we're going to do the Academy Awards out in Los Angeles again, yes? Where all those really, really high-powered high people, and obviously very wealthy people, are going to show up and receive an Academy Award that tells them you're number one. When they receive that, do you think they're really shocked that they won? Or are they more inclined to say, right, I knew I was going to win, I should have won. Look how the ironic ending, put in your notes as ironic ending of this poem. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, because nothing beside remains. Boundless and bare, the lone and level sand stretch far away. What's ironic about this ending? Where are all of his works? They're gone. Who took them? No, no, no. Who took them? Yeah, nature destroyed them. Jot down in your notes at 2A real quickly. A theme. What is the point of the romantic philosophy of this poem? What does it say? No matter what you do as a human being, what always trumps you? The force of nature always wins in the end. Do you think it's possible that the photograph you labored so long to put in an annual will someday be pointed to by some child who is your grandchild or maybe even great-great-grandchild and will say, Grandma or Grandpa, are, is that you? That can't be you. That doesn't even look anything like you. Is that possible that we will age that way? Well, not.